And that whole crucible experience, I mean, we've talked to quite a few people now about, you know, some of the younger ones about maybe the, the time they finally made it to the crucible and then, then the more seasoned pros who kind of just take it in their stride. But I, I mean, Neil Robertson on, on, on here was quite, um, quite critical of the, of the setup of the crucible and particularly about the, the shape of it and the size and how much room you've got to go around, etc. Well, what's your experience? It's so different to everywhere else, isn't it? In that you've got obviously the two tables and you've got the um, the two players sat next to each other as well. I mean, yeah. what's your view on that experience at, at the Crucible? You've had it a few times now. Well, yeah, I mean, it's I, I don't I don't really like people that that say it's it's wrong or you should change it. Or I, I, I'm not for that because. I'm fairly sure it'd be the same size and rear Eardon won it. It's the same test. And there must be players the same height as Neil Robertson. It's not as if he can't fit to play his shot. So he, he would just need to try and deal with it better. Personally, I think it's a little bit of an excuse because he's not really done that well there. He's, he's won it, obviously, in 2010, but his record at the Crucible is horrific for a player as good as what he is. And he's maybe looking for something, reason and why. But I don't think the, 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 the size of the Crucible is the reason why he's not winning. I, I, I can't really have that. I love the Crucible. I bottled it the first time I played in it. Not scared to admit it. Every mm -hmm. single player bottles it. And I completely and utterly, completely bottled it. First time I got there, I got introduced, walked down the stairs and I thought, this is really nice. This is, this is good. First time I'd been there to see it. And then I'm kind of looking about. And I thought, this is this is really nice, I'm going to play well here. And then the partition came down, and as the partition came down, I think the colour must have just went through my face, and I thought, <laughs> that's in the wrong place. I won't, that's a mistake, I won't be able to play, that's too tight, I won't be able to play here. <laughs> and I could not put a ball in the first session. I think I lost 6-3 to James Watner, and I, and I don't know how I won three. And then eventually, the, the second session, I was okay, and I ended up losing the match 10-9. But, um, no, I love it. Love it. Can't can't possibly say a bad thing, and I won't hear anybody say a bad thing about this one. Have you got any stories from it? I mean, we, we've had, you know, we've seen, I guess as viewers, we've seen some of the players when they're sat next to each other, if they've known each other for a while or are close, occasionally they exchange words when they're sat there. Most seem yeah. to just look ahead or look at the queue or, or do something yeah. else. But uh, have you got any stories or anything from the, you know, the back room stuff? Well, yeah. Other players? I think all, all in all, the majority of the times when you're playing a match, you, you don't really speak to the player. I can, I can remember playing a big match against Mark Allen. Well, it, it was certainly big for me. It was the, was it the quarter? It might have been the last 16. I ended up winning 13 12. But I basically, yeah. had, if, I, if I won that match, I was back in the top 16. So it was really important for me. In fact, I think that might have been... Oh, I can't remember. Was that 2010? It was 10. I can remember playing him and we actually were chatting basically all the way through the match. I got on quite well with Mark Allen and mm -hmm. we were, every time I would hit a century, I would go back and say good break and, that was, that was, and I would do the same with him and then we chatted away, talking about the table. And But it doesn't happen that much. It doesn't really happen that much. Um, I mean, I can remember... I'd be just talking about maybe like stories, like even I obviously wasn't happy when 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 I played Ronnie um, in 06 as well in the semi finals where he bit his tip off, and I was, mm. I was you know I was fuming. I mean I was I think it's because I was really I was really pumped and psyched up for the game, um, and kind of beforehand, um, as I said at the time I was coached with Dell. And, and, and before, in 2004, Ronnie dubbed me in the final. He was just, it was probably the best snooker that I've ever seen. I couldn't cope. I couldn't I couldn't cope with him. He, he was just, yeah. safety and everything about it. He was like a robot. He was yeah, playing. he started off well in that one, Graham. You were 5 0 that one. Yeah, I mean, I started off good, but I mean, geez, oh, he was just, mm. he, was, he was just so good. He was, honestly, it was phenomenal. It was like Man City trying to play Stevenage. It was just, <laughs> It, it, it was just too much good. It was just too good. So I play him in 06. Um, and, it, and it's hard not to be intimidated. I don't I don't get intimidated with players. But if you're playing Ronnie O'Sullivan over two days and over four sessions, eight mm -hmm. frames a session, and it's first day 17, it's very hard to actually believe that you're going to win because he's that yeah. good. And I remember the first session, I lost at 5-3. 
And I actually thought I played pretty good. I was quite happy the way I played. And I was speaking to Dale, and Dale could see that I was a bit downcast. And um, because I, I, I wouldn't have won this match without Dale. There's, there's no, I just wouldn't have won it. And I was speaking to Dale, and he says, what, what, What's wrong with you? And I said, Well, I, I don't think I can win. And I've never said that before. I've never mm -hmm. said that ever. And he says, What do you mean you don't think you can win? And I said, Well, I played pretty well there. And, and I've lost at 5 3. And I'm not sure if I'll play that well again tomorrow. And then I've got another two sessions to go. I don't even know if I can keep up with that. And that wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. And Dell sat and spoke to me for a couple of hours and he broke the match down. And everything he said was exactly the way it went. I, I, I just can't believe the way he talked me through them. Everything that he said, he says, you, he says, forget the 5 3. He says, we'll just go for two each. If you've got as many sessions, we'll go for two each. He says, and I want you to win safety battles. He said, I want you to concentrate on the safety battles as a match on its own. He says, because if you win the safety battles, at the time, Ronnie was biting his tip off constantly. He was changing his tips all the time and his long potting wasn't really that good. Everything else about his game was good, but his long potting wasn't good. And Dell said, if you can win the safety battles, you'll frustrate him. And if you frustrate him, you've got half a, you've got a really good chance of winning. So I can remember going out for the second session. And it, Del, Del would explain the fact that when I played Nigel Bond, I might need to play a really good safety. He'll play one back. I'll play a good gym. He'll make a mistake. He says, when you played Neil Robertson, you might need to do three. He says, when mm. you're playing one, you might need to do five. You might, and you need to be prepared to try and win that. And it felt, I went out of the match and I felt really psyched up. I thought, first, he broke off, left me in a cushion. I thought, here we go. <laughs> and I play a safety. He plays one. I play one. He play one. I play one. He makes a mistake. And I genuinely felt like going, yay! <laughs> I was trying to treat it as an actual match. Yeah. And I did frustrate him because my safety was really good. Mm -hmm. And everything that Dell was saying was, was, was going the way I thought. So I've went to the session and I'm... I'm from 5-3, I've went, um, what would the score have been? It would have been 8-7 to him. And he was in in the last frame, and I think he might have done like 50 odd. I was like 50 odd behind. And I made a really good clearance of 50 odd to steal it, to go 8 all. And I can remember going to shake his hand, and he really gripped it mm. more than he would normally grip it. He just noticed things. Yeah. But it was like an aggressive shake. And I thought then, Perfect. That's it. It's eight all, and I've got them. It's now a game, and I had a game plan on how to try and win. And then from eight all, it was just the all they ever said was just bring two each, just go out. I'll see you then. We'll bring back two each, and we'll deal with two each. And if it goes all the way to the end, you you bottle will hat will we'll stand up. So just bring two each back. And obviously I went in and I brought four nothing back. And then he said that's good. Bring two each back again. And obviously again, I won four nothing again, and that was the eight frames, and it was it was good. And and I said you could see him getting more deflated as the frames were going on, to the extent he looked uninterested, which mm -hmm. was which was really good. So uh, without Dale, I don't think I'd have won. I wouldn't have won that game. It, it just shows you the importance of having someone in your corner. You, you know yeah. that 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 managed to change your perspective of the match, yeah. and or or that could have been an onslaught from Ronnie. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. I, I yeah, can't remember so. when, he, when he bit his tip off, but I, I can just remember I was raging. Like I was proper fuming. Because <laughs> I thought I thought his tip had fell off. Because he, he never actually said nothing to me. He just walked out the arena. And the referee said his tip's off. So I thought it had fell off. So I then get back to my changing room and I find out he bit it off. So I'm now out the changing room and I'm at the tournament director and I'm saying, this is a disgrace. and he shouldn't be, He's not allowed to bite his tip off. And, and Ronnie was actually there. I, I could see him, and he, he could hear me. But I was, I was proper mm. livid. But like, this is—I mean, how long have we taken? Are we, we going to just wait until Ronnie gets a good tip on? I was really taking the nip. Um, so it made it to me. It felt like a grudge match, but it wasn't. Yeah. But I, I tried to make it feel to me as if it was, and and it helped me. So I, t I take it when he bit his tip off, that wasn't the end of the session. It was during the session. No, no, that was during the session. That might have yeah. been. He might have bit the tip off it. I don't, I don't know, 7-6. But it was at a time that I was coming back into the game. And it was yeah. quite important. I, I was on a roll. It was my momentum, which 
all stinger players will tell you about the crucible. It's all about momentum. And mm-hmm. I had the momentum, and, and he bites his tip off, and I think that's just... Because he was apparently seen on TV biting it off. So I'm not allowed to do that. I'm a fellow should have. I bit the tip off. I would have got in trouble for it. Yeah. But, um, but as I said, it all worked out good. So it was good. And, and, and I mean, it's hard not to have any podcast without talking about Ronnie O'Sullivan. I mean, just, just because of the, you know, just how yeah. amazing his play is and, and what he's capable of doing. But, um, how do you find him generally? I mean, he's obviously quoted a lot, isn't he, in the media and yeah. about the game, and he sometimes says things that makes it sound as if he's looking for a soundbite, or somebody's looking for a soundbite. I mean, how do you experience him from, you know, you've got a bit more closely and personal than, than most yeah, of us I mean, ever would? He kind of keeps himself to himself, so he doesn't really mix that much um, mm-hmm. with the players, so it's hard to really gauge anything other than, I don't really listen to his interviews because I I think he, he says a lot of things but and then he'll say something totally different in the next interview and so I don't really know. But I mean I know that one of the times that um when I was when I was going through my depression for the first time and I was pretty bad with it, Ronnie called me, which out of the blue, which which I thought was a really, really nice touch because I, I don't really speak to him. I wouldn't say he was I was a mate or I was pleasant to him, I'll say hello to him at tournaments, but it was nice of him to do that. So I think that probably shows what he actually is like. I think there's there's, there's nothing wrong with him. I think he's, he's at, deep down, he's a really, really nice person. It's just sometimes when you hear him in his interviews, he does say a lot of kind of stupid things um, that doesn't do him any good. And did you get much support? You mentioned the depression and, you know, a lot of, there's a lot, isn't there, about trying to encourage people to talk about it and, this, you know, and men in particular, I guess. Yeah. Um, did you get much support through the support, through the sport, really, through the sport, the the tour people, and, yeah. um, or did you whether you wanted it or not as well? I guess. Pro- yeah, probably not really at the time. I don't think yeah. even at the time. Kind of, it, it was. I think if it happened now, they, they would be a lot more kind of hands on, and they look out for things like that now, and they, they would they would be linked to try and get support. But even if they probably was there, I probably wouldn't have done it anyway. Because, I mean, it's one of the big things with depression you don't really want to talk to anybody. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's quite hard to get help if you don't really want to talk to anybody. So, um, but no, I mean, I think if it happened now, there there is more things in place now. It's a lot um, more open, I think, depression now than than what it was then. Yeah, it's it's good to see it be less kind of um, taboo, isn't it, really? And the more people that, I guess the more people in the public eye that say that that's something they've been through, then... Um, then, then hopefully it becomes something that you know it isn't treated with kind of a yardstick almost. But uh, yeah, yeah, and, and and is that again you know without getting too personal, is that something that you you kind of always had to think about or, or yeah, you know, it's something, been, yeah, it's something I love with it's something that yeah. I, I don't really think it ever goes away. I don't think it's yeah. something that I don't think it's anything that you can see. Oh, yeah, I, I used to have that, but I don't have it anymore. It's always lingering it's always kind of you're never far away so you, you kind of need to keep your eye on it and make sure that, that kind of you're okay yeah almost well almost like treating it like an illness that can come back in a way isn't it rather than yeah something you can switch on and off it's yeah yeah that's as, right as you say yeah um who did you look at we're, we're you know really interested in in kind of your again your perspective on who's around you and you just said a little bit about some of the people in the game and Getting on with Mark Allen at the games, etc. Um, now, one of one of the people Lee would, would want an inside track on, I'm sure, is, is Stephen Hendry, and, and and I'm sure you probably had your share of uh, of seeing Stephen. And um, again, is he somebody that you, in terms of game face, we talk about you know players who are different on the on the, at the table and away from the table. He's been famed really, hasn't he, for being kind of really quite one route, very focused. Yeah, kind of changes almost. Um, is he someone you got close to with you know the Scottish setup and, and not really no if I'm no. being honest not really um, he kind of played in Stirling which was a, was yeah. a little bit away from me um, but no I never I mean I've never had any kind of kind of um, kind of bad bad vibes from or anything we just we've, we've never really been that close um, but he, he was kind of a bit like Davis in his prime mm. Davis kind of would Walk into a venue, he's never spoke to anybody, plays his match, walks back out again. Ronnie does that as well, kind of. So I think that's yeah, just the way it's... 
He's quite quite aloof, isn't he? And I, yeah. I think that was he was trying to create that mystique sort of when he was playing his matches, like this yeah. this guy's sort of half not human. Yeah. You know, he never he's, mixed and he was just he's kind, of more, he's kind of more approachable now. Yeah. He's actually doing commentary. And even when when I hear him or, or I see him speaking to other people and I think, doesn't he sound like Stephen Henry? He's just cause he's more <laughs> he's more fun and he and he he'll kind of have a laugh with things and as when he wouldn't really have done that when he was playing. So um, I was never really that kind of that close to him. Yeah, and we're, we're, again, one of the people who knows you coming on and wants to ask you a question, Christopher, I think it's Manuel. And um, he was intrigued really into your thoughts on the comeback, you know. I mean, we, we, again, we talked to a coach yesterday who worked with Jimmy White and he talked about the recurring wild card that Jimmy gets. Um, yeah. Obviously, Henry back and not exactly... Well, to put it mildly, not setting the world alight, but I, I just wondered, you know, I think he was curious as to what your thoughts were on, on Henji's comeback and, and maybe more broadly about some of these guys who were still on the tour, you know, but maybe not competing at anything like what they used to. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's really, really hard for for Stephen. I think he, he retired way too soon. Mm -hmm. after start. And I think if, if, if Stephen never retired, I think he would comfortably still be in the top 32 just now. But the fact that he did retire and didn't play for whatever it was, so many years, it's it's nearly impossible for him to get back to anywhere near. Because the game's moved on as well. He, he's not kind of evolved with the game. The game's moved on. The game's a lot harder now than what it was when he was playing. So um, it's really, really, really tough. And I think he would say that himself. It's going to be really tough because he's He's playing first rounds. The, the, the guys are so good in the first mm -hmm. rounds now. It's not like the time when he was when he was dominating the Crucible where he could play two rounds at the Crucible against people that he was an absolute certainty to beat. Mm. It's, it's, the game's so much. The, the game at the top might not be as good as it was um, from the, like the, the late 90s, early, early 90s, but the, the bottom half is... The bottom end of the tour now is just outrageous. How how good the standard mm. is, and that's the end that Stephen's coming in at. That's I think you'll find it really really tough. I mean, I mean Stephen obviously coming back um, after so many years, he's not got that fear factor as as well. Mm. And everybody seems to be playing amazing against Stephen. So, and I think that's maybe down to he's not got that fear factor, and he, he actually refuses to play safe. Yeah, well, I guess the thing, I mean, if he's still going to play with the same kind of game that he did used to play with, he's obviously not going to pot the amount of balls that he did pot then. And if he does make a mistake, he's going to get punished all the time. So it's very, very, it's, honestly, I think it's very, very hard for me to come back to, to a standard that he would like. Um, I wish him all the best, but I think it's going to be really, really tough for me to do that. We we also had uh, well, again this is a good name. This is on Twitter. Where where's the cue ball going? This is the name of this account, uh, <laughs> and it's linked a little bit to the question about you know the world championships. But I mean, I think I think they they've obviously got belief in you and wondering about your aspirations. They wondered if you still believe that you could win more ranking titles, and I guess that's about ambitions and and aspirations now at this point in your career, really. Yeah, I mean, I, it's hard to say that I don't think I could win another title. Um, purely on the basis of I've, I've been kind of in a few finals not that long ago so it's, it's hard mm -hmm. to say that you couldn't do it but things need to fall um, things need to fall right with you in tournaments you need a little bit of luck you need, you need a little bit of one that you're playing incredibly well for a whole week and two maybe the draws open up a little bit where you, you, you don't need to beat John Higgins Ronnie Sullivan Neil Robertson sometimes the draw opens up and before you know it, you find yourself in a semi-final, and yeah, I, I still believe I can I could win some. Um, obviously, world championships could be, I would think, realistically probably beyond me. But um, I certainly still think I'm good enough to win a tournament. And do you have any preferences? You know, again, one of the big talking points last season was about the length of matches, and you know, the British Open being really quite short in terms of the the magnitude of the prize and the title and very short matches to lead up to the latter stages. I mean, do you have any yeah. preferences on that? Um, are you, do you prefer yeah. to have a longer game? Yeah, longer game all day, every day, twice on yeah. a Sunday. It's only, yeah. it's only, we only basically play one 
proper tournament a year, which is the World Championships, because it's, it's a proper match. I, I, I'm obviously for Scotland, know nothing about cricket. But it's, it's like trying to say that the, pro, the the real purist who loves cricket would say test cricket's the best ever. They wouldn't yeah. be interested in 2020. The majority of the tournaments we play are 2020. Yeah. It's not just too, they're just too quick. The standard's so high nowadays that you, you, how can you play best of seven and actually think there's a match? Look, 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 the match that I've explained to you there with Ronnie Sullivan, a story gets told through the match and you, you can see mm. momentum swings and that's the that's the, why the crucible is brilliant, and you don't we don't get that really in in, in tournaments when you're just and playing best of sevens. And I think the longer matches would uh, sort of suit your game as well, Graham. Uh, and it's no no surprise you've done so well at the crucible, but you must have been disappointed to see the likes of the UK being yeah you know, fixes and yeah yeah it's, it's it's tough. I mean, obviously it's it's been that long now. That when we go to the UK and we play our best of 11, that actually does feel quite long. The best yeah. of 11 feels as if we've actually got plenty of time. But when it used to be first to nine, and then obviously you had the world still first to 10, we had the international championship in China, which was first to six. And there was a lot more of them. Now, to be honest, it just seems like all we're playing in is, is best of sevens. Mm. which And then we're even playing in best of fives. And there was even a tournament a couple of years ago that was just um, best of threes. And you think, it's just, where are we going? What, what, what are we doing? Are we going back to pro am days? And mm -hmm. I don't. I just don't see why they can't. The, the minimum match should be best of nine. That's just a minimum. We shouldn't be playing best of sevens. Best of sevens were during the time when Barry Hearn was trying to grow the game, and we were trying to get to different countries and different places. But the game has grown now. We shouldn't be playing best of sevens. Yeah, they, well, I think again, most of the players we've had on have, have said the same. Really, I think that's a, a commonly, commonly felt thing. Because I guess from the outside looking in at it, you know, you said yourself how much a match can ebb and flow during this during the match and have very different sessions. So, I mean, you know, you're a, se you're a session and you've lost your match, really, isn't it? So yeah. in a way, um, and you do see it, don't you? You see some players who do very well during the season. We had this debate last year about who was the number one, Judd Trump or Mark Selby because of who was winning the World Championships and then who was gathering all the titles during the season. Um, yeah. So so it, it does seem really, doesn't it, that there's a there's an element there of how do you find out who the best players are? It's a bit like T20, isn't it? You know, the good England yeah. T20 team might be a rubbish England test team because it's such yeah. a different discipline. Mm -hmm. well, what a lot. There's, 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 too much, there's too much luck involved mm. uh, in a best of seven. There's actually too much luck involved in a best of nine. But I guess I mean, you can at least handle a little bit because you have an interval. So yeah. you have some sort of leeway. But a best of seven, I mean, I played a match in the best of seven in the Scottish Open. I played against Igor Figueredo. Good player. It was a relatively hard draw, first round. Igor had six shots. I won four nothing and he had six shots. It has to, I, I've, nobody's told me, but it has to be a record. That, I would imagine that would be some sort of world record for the least amount of shots in a match. And two of them was break-offs. Yeah. So he only actually had four shots in open play. And, oh. and he's lost four nothing. Uh, and yeah, it's a bit it's a bit harsh. Well that that shows you that obviously a bit of luck comes in yeah, and obviously if your opponent just plays brilliant, you know and it turns, you know, turns over. Same thing happened to me at the, the championship league there where you were playing best of fives, which is even less again. I lost um, 3 0 to one of the Chinese players. And I think two of the frames, I just played one shot. I think I broke off, ton. I lost a close frame in the second, and in the third frame, I played one shot, ton. That's the, so, so it's very hard to try and gauge that somebody could fall so far in the rankings playing a best of five or a best of seven. Mm. I don't, it's one of the things I don't think is right. I don't think it's right. And what about what about the size of the tour? That's the other debate we've, we've had a lot. You know, whether some people have talked about having almost a tour and then a secondary tour, but with less players yeah. in it, because um, it does seem harsh. Again, looking from the outside, it's not a player that you come off the tour and suddenly you're not considered a pro. But yet, ten minutes ago you were a pro, and yeah. you could go back to being a pro, but you're suddenly an amateur. It, it's it's the tour. The, I mean. This is opinion, isn't it? We're not the policy makers, but yeah. is the tour a good size or do you think that could be different? I think the, the tour the tour could be a good size if we were as popular as golf or tennis. 
But the fact of the matter is we're not we're not golf or tennis. So it works for them because the, it's, they're huge and there's so much money that they can play the f- first round of Wimbledon loser can still get whatever he gets, 15 grand, 20 grand. We don't have that. So if the money's not there, I could understand the reason why they would cut the tour, but you can't cut the tour and then throw the rest away. If you were going to cut the tour to 64, this is something that I've never thought about, but you've just asked the question. If if you cut the tour to 64, the 64 could then get paid a decent amount of money where, where they could earn a living. And then the other 64 that fell off, along with amateurs, would need to have decent tournaments where they can play lots of tournaments where the first round, uh, sorry, the winner might get 15 grand. But they'd be playing against people of kind of their own standard and their own... So I don't know if they would be happy with that as well. And that's their way of getting back on the tour. Something like that, where there's the top 64 and 16 fall off and the other 16 from who done well in the, the, the other part of the tour come back on. Might be a way of helping it and helping be able to generate money throughout the tour. Because it shouldn't just be the, the top end of the game that gets all the money. No, that, that was interesting. I remember that when we talked to Jason Ferguson. There seemed to be almost a bit, I think it's linked into sponsorship. It sounded like there was almost a pride in being able to say as a headline, this is the top prize. It's a massive mm. check, a big check and all of that. Um, yep. And the, the betting companies like that, you know, a lot of the time being yep. the betting companies, or I guess we get Kazoo a lot more now as well. So yep. not just the, the betting companies, but almost the prestige of that's what's at stake. This is the big deal. But as you said, you know, it seems to be rewarding excellence, but not nurturing players further down who eventually he- want to see actually, up at the top. We, we actually heard it from the horse's mouth. I remember being at a players meeting and Barry Hearn said the exact same thing. Exact same thing. Barry Hearn, I have got absolutely no doubt, would hold a tournament where it would be 800 grand to the winner and nothing for anybody else. And he would consider that a tick box because he showed the sponsors that it's 800 grand to the winner. And that's, in my opinion, that would be kind of the problem because he's trying to drum up the first round prize, but it's not them that need it. <laughs> Neil, Neil Robertson doesn't need the extra 45 grand. I'm sure he'd be quite happy with 220. He doesn't need 265. And the other 45 could get fed down to the players who actually need it. And, and I, But I don't think it'll ever happen. But that's what I think should happen, but it, it won't, I don't think. Yeah, and I think it's Q school as well. I think some of the players talk to us about how they worry if they ever came off the tour, whether they'd actually want to go through the whole Q school process. And um, and, and we've obviously seen some players come back and, and do well to get back on there. But, I mean, it's it's really brutal, isn't it? You can kind of see how good players could be lost from the game if they happen to come off the tour, despite being very good players. So it's, it's just harder now than what it was. I mean, Neil Robertson fell off the tour. Mm. And Ricky Walden fell off the tour um, or didn't get through Q school or something like that years and years and years ago. So they're, they're two phenomenal players that you might have lost. They've managed to get back on. But if it happened now, it's harder now. It's harder for them to get one to get through Q school. And you can see it when they get through and they celebrate. Yay, yeah, that's me back at pro. This is fantastic. But they've still not won anything yet. You're now a pro. You've got a two gear card. Yeah. Welcome to Ronnie O'Sullivan in the first round. <laughs> oh, did you beat me right there, John Higgins? You've got no, it's a European Masters next. You've got Neil Robertson. And let's see how long they like that before they eventually start going, oh, I've got Neil Robertson again. This is pathetic. Mm-hmm. I have the bills to pay. <laughs> and yeah. I, that's where I think the game is, is a bit wrong because I don't care how good you are. You go on to the tour and you've got two years to get in the top 64. You need to be really good. You need to be a proper player to stay on. And, and I think it's too hard. Yeah, we, yeah, I, I, get, I mean, if I, we could have written this. This is, I think we, we talk about this quite a lot. And I, but I think that's because we've got the interest of the wider game. And we, we care about yeah. that rather than maybe the prestige of, of top people looking glitzy and getting big sponsors. But you can understand from also from the organizer's point of view that sponsorship is such a big thing. But anyway, we, we're not going to sort that out today. Um, it's, uh, We'd like to move, Graham, to, if you'd indulge us on this one, we'd like to move to something that we call Clearing the Colours. Um, mm-hmm. And it's a chance for us just to get your, your take on a few 
few questions just about yourself, your preferences, things that, um, that, that maybe people would like to know about. So, so for the yellow ball, this is the first one. For the yellow ball, then, we're just interested in who you find being the kind of the funniest player that you've met, maybe the funniest player on tour or just that you've met around and about. The funniest player? Um, um, so I always quite get a good laugh with Tom Ford. I always find mm -hmm. Tom Ford quite funny. No, 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 because he's actually trying to be funny, just because he, he's moaning <laughs> and everything. And um, <laughs> I always find Tom really funny. But I go on well with all the, all the Scottish boys, to be honest. I'm mean, a good laugh with John Higgins and we go to turn on it. So, but I would, I would say Tom Ford because I think he's, I just think he's quite funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, the yellow way, Graham. Uh, green ball question. What's your favourite venue away from the Crucible? Berlin. The, the yeah. tempo um, it's just hard to beat. I mean genuinely hard to beat. I played um I played Judd Trump in the semi finals recently, like a few years ago. Um and we were we were backstage up the stairs waiting to get introduced. And um they they'd asked uh Brandon Parker recently died. Yeah. Um asked me what was what was my walk on music. And I said it's um uh, back in black ACDC and he says oh my god he says this will be really good he said because <laughs> the BBC when you get introduced they, they turn the music down it's not really that loud so that the people in the TV would hear it but we can barely hear it when we walk out yeah Tempo Drome is just I mean it was absolutely unbelievable because me and Judd were up the top and Judd's obviously won the world and been there at the Crucible final night and we were just laughing at each other it was full and it was just the whole the, it was like a football match the stadium was wrong and then when the music came on, it was deafening. The, the start of the, the song, it was just that was unbelievable place to play, and it's, it's, it's probably my favourite venue, other than the Crucible. It's a really popular answer, isn't it, Michael? Yeah, I think it's the, I probably the most popular. Yeah, I reckon that's the most popular one. Um, okay, so we're, we're, we're motoring, really. So on to the Brown, then. Um, who do you think the next player to win their first world title might be? Um, Jan Bengtow. I think he's got he's got the perfect game for the World Championships. There's, there's players that I think are better than him, but I would still put him ahead of them because his, his game's absolutely perfect for the Crucible. You want a player like that at the Crucible because he's, he's, he's not really up or down. He doesn't have a phenomenally good session and then he has a nightmare session like a lot of players do. He's, he's just pretty good. At everything and he's always pretty good and he's solid very hard to beat it's perfect for the crucible and i think much like you graham he's, he's willing to stick in you know when yeah. things aren't going his way he's willing to you know do the hard yards so to speak yeah. and, stick. and i think that's part of the reason why i've probably done well myself at the crucible it's the, it's the yeah. type of game that you have because you can get better players than myself or jan bingtow who, who don't do well at the crucible because they're a bit up and down They'll have a really good session, then they'll lose one six two, and you can't you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So 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 far the yellow, green, and brown have been on their spots, so that's been easy really. But um, I'm gonna add don't want to map the, the, the blue, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the blue the blue isn't quite on its spot. It's in a really slightly naughty position, Lee, isn't it? Yeah, this uh, we're into tricky territory here, there, mate. Mm -hmm. The blue blue ball question: Which actor would you get to play you in the film of your life? Jeez, oh. It's tricky. Titan you think you think emailed me these about two weeks ago? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, what's an actor that moans quite a lot? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, it's such a good question, I don't, I don't really know. I, I genuinely don't know. Um, they don't have to look like, like you. Quite yeah, a few of the yeah. people have named people who don't look like them. I mean, I, I just keep thinking of actors that I like, but... Mm -hmm. It'd be nothing to do with me. I mean, the fact I don't know, Robert De Niro's got nothing. has got nothing to do with me. <laughs> um, maybe you and McGregor. I don't. I don't really know. It's a very, oh, very good one. Yeah, good that's choice. A good answer. That's a really good answer. We haven't had that. I don't think that's a cool one. Yeah, oh, very nice. Um, and the, and the pink. So the blue wasn't that tricky, really. You you, you made it look as if it was, but you, you got it easy. Um, the pink. This is similar to the first one, but what about the nicest player? What about the you know somebody who? 
maybe you just think is a salt of the earth kind of person you've really always liked is there someone like that yeah, yeah. i would probably say a couple but the first one would be john higgins i've always got on well with john higgins um even when john was was um like really good and a lot better than me we, we still got on quite well um he's not one of those players that is kind of you know, up himself He's just, a, he's just a really good guy. You get him the same all the time. And we have a good laugh with the football. Obviously, he's a big Celtic fan, a big Rangers fan. So I, I would say John. But lower down, players like Andrew Higginson, mm-hmm. Mickey Walden, Tom Ford, there's, there's Matthew Stevens. They're all, they're all, there's, there's lots of nice people. They're not all, they're not all horrible. <laughs> there's <laughs> lots of nice people, but it's probably John Higgins. Uh, it's, it's nice to know. It's nice to hear about, you know, how people kind of experience the other players. That's something you don't really get too much as a fan, yeah. I don't think. Um, great, that's the pink. I always twitch the black. <laughs> oh, I think we've made we've made Lee freeze potentially here. <laughs> Can you hear us, Lee? Okay. I think Lee will join <laughs> hopefully Lee will come back. I think the power that you put the pink away with seems to blow him <laughs> away. Um so we'll <laughs> We'll move to the black then, so hopefully we'll be back in a sec. But I wonder what you would call, this is a tricky one, we probably should have given this one well in advance, but uh, unless you've already written your autobiography or, or thinking of episode two, but what would you call your autobiography if you were to write a story of your life? You may be doing it. Mm. Well, the one that I did do was Frame of Mind, but I never picked it. Yeah. Um, I think it would be, it would be something along the lines of my way. Yeah. Because um, I don't think I do things because other people tell me to do it. I've always been quite, um, no, I don't I don't think that's right. So I'll do yeah. this, even if it's not against kind of popular opinion. And I'll, I'll stand up for what I think is wrong. When a lot of people would probably say it's got nothing to do with you, so just shut up. Like what I'm saying there about the players, I think you should deserve a bit of money at the bottom of the tour. It's nothing to do with me. I'm not at the bottom of the tour, but I still think it's wrong. But it would be something along the lines of that. Yeah, yeah. Are you, are you back there, Lee? I am back. Sorry about that. I think my yeah. Wi-Fi. You've, you've uh, missed my fantastic out. answer. <laughs> and he asked my question as well. Was that the blackboard yeah. question? I asked yeah. the question. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry about that, Lee. But you, never mind. You, I, I think I think the ferocity with which the pink went away just knocked you off, didn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Watch the black. The answer was my way. The autobiography. It's it's because to be honest, Graham, we're, we're a bit cheeky because what we do is we then name the episode after the that last that last question. It gives us a bit of a, a headline we can use as part of the put uh, when we put the episode out, so we can put my way on there. All right. Um, well, so look, I mean, I think all that remains really to say, from certainly from my point of view, and I'll let Lee say his bit as well. Um, it's just been really exciting to we've been really excited to get to talk to you. We don't talk to people who have been at the top of the tree as you have and, and continue to still play at such a high level. Um, and so we're really intrigued to, to find out more about you and, and you just come across as a great person. So um, best of luck from, from our point of view, I think, for the, yeah. for the season. And, um, and and every time we get someone on here, I think we always take an extra interest in them and, and how they get on afterwards. So we'll definitely do that. I'll do that anyway. But I'll hopefully, see you. <laughs> yeah, hopefully for, for many more years. So, so Lee, I'm sure that there's stuff you'd like to say. Yeah, yeah. Just before I say goodbye to you, Graham, I just want to thank your uncle George because uh, he actually set up this meeting and he was the go-between, you know, messages sent back and forward. So just want to thank your uncle George for that. And it's been a, an absolute pleasure to have you on. I've always been a big fan of yours. I love watching you play and I wish you all the very best for the future and the rest of your career. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. <laughs>